My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. I've been at Elizabeth Town College for 23 years. Uh, taught at Purdue University before that. I also taught at uh, a little bit at University of Delaware and San Francisco State University and University of Trento in Italy. I was in IBM research before that and uh, at DuPont Children's Hospital, assistive robotics, and uh, built high tech office parks for 10 years before that, <clears throat> Texas to California. It's a little network chip that I designed behind me, one of two in the early 1990s. Uh, this is a course in advanced computer engineering parallel processing. Share screen now. This is not the very first lecture, but it's the first time we're really digging into the, uh, some of the parallel processing things. Uh, up until now, we're doing some review of some basic fundamentals from prerequisite course. Uh, basic idea, students already know this, single processor cache memory processing. Uh, symmetric multiprocessing with uh, or also called shared memory in the past with at least one cache between each processor and most importantly is shared memory. And cache coherency problems, of course, you have to work out when everybody is sharing one piece of memory. Vector register, um, <clears throat> which lends itself to linear algebra and matrix manipulation kind of things, row times column, dot product kind of things. And then MPP systems, where it's essentially a computer network in a box Every processor does its own thing with its own cache and memory, and there's some kind of static or dynamic interconnect architecture that we'll talk about in detail in this class and how they scale. And uh, interprocessor communication, optimization, and uh, law of diminishing marginal returns for that kind of thing. Large network dedicated to a single task um, using the, the internet to help borrow machine cycles to solve things like a human genome. So now, um, so this is advanced class. So we want to get down in the formal Flynn classifications and start drilling down into some of the details. And we have SISTI, MIM, uh, SIMD, MIMD, and MISTI, which this systolic array, I've yet to see anybody actually make a working system like that. But the, uh, yeah, it's still out there. And it's just because of the combinations of single instruction, you know, it's single or multiple instruction or single or multiple data. So you have two binary things. So you have a combination of four things. So the MISTI is just the, for the sake of completeness, really. Uh, SISTI uniprocessor architecture. And so you have instruction stream, a data stream, instruction stream, the fetch and the pipeline and IO between the CU. And, the, and yeah, some of the Nomenclature changes and different texts, uh, but uh, you know you have a control unit here, a processing unit, and you know very often that's the same thing uh, combined. But you know again we're drilling down here, and as we're designing hardware, uh, the control unit will be separate from the data path uh, in design, even if it's physically on the same silicon right next to each other. A memory unit, and uh, that's typically your not your storage, not your optical, or your or, or, or your magnetic or your solid state uh, storage, but that's your, actually your RAM, uh, you know, dynamic RAM, not static RAM of the, stat, of the, of the uh, caches or the registers. And you have instruction stream, data stream, uh, processing elements, so that break, you break down differently in different machines for that, and then local memory. Um, <clears throat> And so we're, you know, this, this, these basic diagrams here, we're not going to obey exactly. We're going to drill down a little deeper and make our own uh, designs. But uh, you can imagine single instruction, single data, single instruction, multiple data. So this applies to a number of kinds of things. A vector certainly does because you have uh, different elements in each of the vectors. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and other things. And then a single instruction or, or a, a multiple instruction, multiple data. So when you're many cores working at the same time, uh, processors, uh, 
instructions and data are spread all over the place. And then um, these will also show more detail later on the whole lecture on some of these architectures, the static and dynamic interconnect architectures. So here is a uh, uniform memory access, uh, multiple instruction, multiple data, shared memory processing scheme with a certain kind of interconnect. And this is actually a dynamic, not a static in interconnect. We'll talk about the bus and the crossbar and the multi-stage are dynamic. Uh, so anything can potentially talk to anything else. And uh, when I was at IBM, we didn't work uh, in the group. We, we had up to 512 processors in, in a Coke machine type uh, supercomputer. Um, and uh, we were still SMP on each core, but you could connect through an optical crossbar switch to other million dollar machines and other kinds of machines and other networks. And that was a big dynamic interconnect. And there's a whole separate processor for that. And we had separate, uh, our whole separate uh, uh, box, parallel sysplex optical interconnect. And then it, the IO processors and channels on each board would talk to those directly with a different instruction set. Um, here's a non uniform memory access. And here you see clusters of processors. And, uh, clustered together and then an MPP machine where everything's all over the place and uh, everybody's doing their own thing. But the way you use this is critical and we'll talk about uh, problems that fit this kind of thing and how you parse your problem, coarse grain versus fine grain problems. And of course you're gonna have to communicate at times between all the different processors, but you want the problem to parse nicely so everybody's doing their own thing uh, when it makes sense to do their own thing and only communicating as needed. And then vector register, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. And you can see there's a scale or and a vector unit. And uh, in the past, students have designed this kind of thing and simulated this kind of thing. Uh, not yet fabricated anything, but that's a little trickier to do uh, without a big budget for that scale of a project. And then there's more on interconnect architectures um, uh, coming up. So this, this is where everything is. So there, I, I'll go there now, but on my YouTube channel, there's a whole uh, uh, series of high-tech lectures as well as intro high-tech lectures. I have over 200 videos now on my YouTube channel and I'm hoping to get the majority of lecture content condensed uh, in this class and a couple others on on the web, on YouTube. So this is static. This is static network architectures. It's the same kind of thing you would see in a net computer networking class. And so we're going to have a whole lecture on this. And we're going to be able to assess these and uh, you know certain metrics with uh, the number of nodes and the network diameter and degree and bisection width and the number of wires per, per connection. And you know how these things scale, right? Um, and, uh, and you know, different topologies and how you would assess them. So that will be another lecture. And also in that same lecture, those were static interconnect architecture. We'll have the dynamic interconnect architecture. So the most common is the bus, and the bus is you know is a shared uh, roadway more than an actual bus. Things in it. It's 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 everything can connect to the bus but uh, you can't have everybody communicating all at the same time. You need a bus controller and uh, you know, people you know, asking for access. And you need electrical isolation too with you know, buffers, tri-state buffers and things. And we do something similar to that um, we have in the you know, like interfacing class in the past. Where we've made a serial bus uh, for, well, in, 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 for communication between devices and then also a common bus for everybody to use with uh, that they could tie on to with uh, tri-state buffers. I could do that in this class. Now, the labs are yet to be defined. So I've been teaching this class every other year since 1999, and I try to switch it up uh, a little bit each time, sometimes a lot for what the students do. There's a whole separate lab section to the lecture section. Uh, this is a crossbar switch here. So these are all dynamic architectures. Uh, this is a less common thing. I've seen 
plenty of buses and uh, crossbar switches on the big scale things uh, and IBM. And I haven't seen this multi-stage interconnect network. And then you can, we'll talk about this, how things uh, scale as a function of different variables and the O is on the order of. And so we wanna talk about that. Oh, this is a review for those who have had, and everybody in this class has had my microcomputer architecture intro class, which used to be intro to computer engineering, but we're restructuring and that's going to be an elective now. And so some students in the future won't have this. So I'm putting this in here now uh, and elaborating on it. But uh, in the future, there'll be students watching this for the first time in this course. So the levels of computing, and I want to show something inside of IBM that we did too in a minute here. Uh, are, are these embedded PCs, PC server, or workstation, mini computer, supercomputer, and the architectures we know from above, SMP, MPP, are, are embedded. So, um, uh, uh, and Uni processors too. I should put that on here, but I mean they certainly can be. Well, uh, uh, they are actually shared memory processors. You know, if you have just uh, a single processor, that's essentially a shared memory processor too. It just doesn't have more than one core. But now everything's multiple core, even if it's single core. I mean, it can be really simple. Uh, and my point is embedded systems can be really complex also. Uh, PC, um, uh, the uh, SMP, let me try something here. Or, or, let me ask the students real quick. Are, are you seeing my picture on the screen as I'm talking, anybody? Jeff? Okay, I, it's just not showing on my screen. So I, I recorded a video the other day and it wasn't showing me in the top corner. So I assume that it is. Let me just stop sharing and share again differently. I, I sorry for the audience here for a second. So I'm going to do share screen again. And then I'll pick this one. Uh, pick uh, okay, just the same. All right. Okay, so I assume I'm and not that it needs my picture up in the corner, but I just I think it's nice on video recording have the person. Okay, so uh, most of these students have seen this before. I want to go fast for their sake. Uh, they're, they're allowed to multitask in this particular studio kind of class uh, if it gets redundant, and then people who haven't seen it before can take a little longer listening to this. Um, but you know, you see the different classes and of uh, architectures and levels. Uh, applications embedded is real-time control, automobile appliances, factor automation, aerospace, and defense. Uh, uh, general PCs, just everything, PC, laptop, everybody knows that. Uh, a PC server workstation, essentially just a beefed up PC, but it can work as a server. And it also uh, typically has more powerful graphics cards and uh, uh, traditionally was more uh, multiprocessor in the beginning. Uh, mini computers is just really is just a, a, a smaller scale version of the larger SMP machines. I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's vector register and MPP and large networks and all the supercomputers. And that's what we're focused on in this class is the supercomputer. That's why I have the bold and red and the parallel processing. Uh, characteristics, I used to have prices on here, but that changes so often that's not sustainable to keep prices on a lecture that you want to show more than one time. Embedded, cheap, small, and can be extremely fast, but typically not. Maybe hardened for industry space and ah, it's just military, military, it should say. Um, uh, I'm not going to change that in the video here, but uh, there's one risk of running. I, I do PowerPoints with embedded uh, audio, and then I can change those before I save them as MP4s and upload to, to YouTube. But I'm doing this one live from a PowerPoint, so this is the risk you run. I'm not going to re-record it. That just should say military there. And it also is not necessarily cheap if it's a military system. So I sort of added that. I just added the military today. Um, PC faster than typical embedded, but otherwise relatively slow. Mini computer very fast. Supercomputer ideas to go fast. And then embedded systems. So we've talked about these in other courses. Uh, uh, the uh, interfacing class, digital design two and interfacing is now being merged with digital design. The lab's going in there, but that's going to be called digital and embedded systems. So where students first learn about the difference between microcontroller and microprocessor. We'll touch on it here also in a minute, but it'll be an elaboration uh, for the advanced students. And then ASICs, you can design for a specific task. 
Uh, programmable logic controllers, PLCs, uh, we learn about those in here and we have a bunch of those. Um, and then microprocessors for PCs, servers, workstations, typical multiple microprocessors, many computers, uh, AS400, we'll talk about in a second, and Amdahl and, and HP and Hitachi. Talk about the competition when I was there in the mid 1990s. And then some supercomputers. So I just, I mean, there's a lot of other ones here I could list too. Oh, this S390 I just put up here because that's what I worked on, but also the whole Power Parallel and the SP2. And then there's, there's a whole a couple dozen supercomputers now. Well, typically they're all becoming MPP. So I just put IBM stuff here. So the SP2 is a deep blue. This is from the Power Parallel group that was working right next to us. It was only 20 people. We had 2,000 for the S390. But the SP2 was just a special purpose thing to play chess beat Kasparov in 93, 1993. Uh, Cray vector register. Now we had a vector register unit we patched on in the system 390. We could do all the same kind of operations, but the Cray was built and was the first to really do serious number crunching uh, with vectors. And then the large networks PC up there. Operating systems you, for embedded systems, especially on the NASA rovers, things you are far away, you wanna do real time, even interrupt driven kind of operating systems. Um, you don't want a lot of overhead. PCs, we all know all the stuff that flavors that comes in. Um, and then servers, Windows, you know, mini computers, Unix, a bunch of different operating systems. And so the difference between them here, again, this is review for most everybody in here. The microcontrollers, um, so this paper, that uh, we're going to drill down into some of the code for that and simulate some of the code for that coming up soon here. And mostly in the context of the students will design their own instruction set and create, simulate from gate level their own hardware and instruction set. And then they want to be able to compare it to a real working uh, instruction set. So uh, we do assembly language simulations. And anyway, so microprocessors and microcontrollers. Microcontroller is intensely simple, simple for single chip embedded applications. RISC versus CISC, there's a whole lecture coming up on that in detail here, uh, why you would want less instructions versus more. Uh, historically, the big giant machines had a lot of powerful instructions and then it ballooned to the point that most programmers didn't use most of them. So then around 1990-ish, there was a big paradigm shift in both microprocessors and microcontrollers to go more RISC. But since then, the instructions have added back up again. And it's not just the instruction, specific instructions, but the addressing modes too. So um, that's the stuff of uh, some of the language programming class, which is actually somewhat a prereq for this now. Um, it's going to be part of the new embedded systems and digital design class. It was in a separate class, it was in alternating years. And sometimes this course got ahead of that one. But anyway, so uh, microprocessors, you have floating point. You should remember what that is in detail and the difficulty and trick of having to handle a Mantissa and a, uh, an exponent and do that uh, number representation. Because in hardware, that's much more complicated than integers. And we're talking about hardware design here. Uh, and so microprocessors are very versatile. Um, Microcontrollers are meant for, uh, this is digital to analog conversion, analog digital conversion, pulse width modulation, motor control. Okay, so here's something uh, that's a sort of a fun inside story. So this is inside IBM. And it used to be IBM confidential, but this is 1996. So uh, this is 26 years later, this is not relevant data. But it makes for nice stories. And so this is IBM versus Omdal versus uh, Hitachi. Hitachi Data Systems is the HDS in the third column there. And I won't go through all the criteria here, but what this was was a briefing for the design groups uh, from marketing showing what the competition was up to and how we squared up to them. And not, um, not just for the System 390, but also the uh, AS400, which was in Rochester, Minnesota. Now everything, the main bulk of everything IBM does, research, development, main design, uh, CEOs, all financial stuff is upstate New York, um, Hudson Valley. 
But of course, there's stuff all over the world. There's 450,000 people inside of IBM. We had our own intranet with optical lines that we leased between the cities and under the ocean. This was in Rochester, Minnesota, and they were using the stuff that we were developing, you know, our processor for the system 390, but in smaller machines. And so this is showing the competition in AS400. So the, the mini computers are up to 500 people. The stuff we were making, you could run the whole government on it, air traffic controlled New York Stock Exchange. Uh, these machines, you could run a company with like 500 people. And the note, the one interesting note here, and I think some of these students have heard this story before, but you'll see that, um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. I'm gonna drill down all the details here and lots of interesting things in the notes saying that, you know, Omdow is claiming some ability to do this. And I mean, so this is like, you know, uh, good information for competition. Note Hitachi dependent on IBM. So I didn't write it all down here, but some of you have heard this story. So I'll tell it again here. First time recorded. Um, I don't think anybody in IBM would get upset. Is that we were having a big uh, briefing for everybody in the lab, 2,000 of us in the research and development lab for System 390, and it was very competitive at the time. Uh, you know, the normal cycle time, you know, it was two years between big version changes, and then went down to a year. And we were getting down to every six months new new competition coming out and we'd have to release new things. It was really tight and it was really hot for all levels of computing in the mid 1990s. And it's cycled up and down since then, of course. But this was an interesting thing because somebody raised their hand and they asked the, uh, the speaker and she was the, the speaker was the head of the lab. Uh, she was the director of the lab and somebody with, you know, a kind of a annoyed, uh, Demeanor asked, why the heck are we selling our IBM chips to Hitachi? The processors, we make, make our own processors, like Intel does, you know, same kind of thing, but these are IBM processors. Uh, and by the way, that's a whole other story. We made, the, IBM made the, the, the uh, PowerPC chip, which went into the Max for a while before they switched to Intel. But you know, wh why, why, so this guy's, why, why are we doing this? Why would we possibly give our competition our processors? And the, and the speaker didn't answer right away. And then the, and, and she gave an answer that was like a political answer, but she didn't really want to say exactly why. The guy got really irate. He's like, why the heck are we doing that? You know, things are tight now, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got time, time frame to get things out. And, and uh, we, just, they just, we just had come out of a big recession uh, you know, so people are still a little panically, panicky because of that. It was a Gulf War recession, 1991, right after that. But anyway, so the, the, her answer was, well, uh, and reluctantly, she said, well, you know, if times get really tough uh, and things, you know, it's hard to, to supply the chips we need for both Hitachi and us, IBM, we'll have them. <clears throat> And everybody was, you could hear a pin drop for a minute there. Uh, but that's the reality of it. And especially right now, this is 2022, where you see the supply chain and chip shortages, uh, especially since what 90% of them come from Southeast Asia. And if we get in any kind of international TIF, you know, over, uh, where they're, you know, areas where they're coming from because of geopolitical disputes, um, um, I thought that was telling. Now, there's a lot of other stuff in here I don't want to go into, but we'll, uh, it'll be part of the design process. And some of these are acronyms that you wouldn't recognize. So before we move forward, make sure you understand the difference between integers and floating point and number ranges that are needed. And so uh, you want to keep it as simple as possible. I didn't put up from my robotics and machine intelligence class the simplicity that's in the rovers, but this intentionally as simple as possible. And NASA, NASA keeps things intentionally as simple as possible. Not to see exactly what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX. Uh, but, but I assume same kind of thing. You land on another planet, you don't want to have some super complex thing. You want to really strip down real-time operating system running right the rover. You want as simple as hardware as possible. Now you probably need floating points because you're doing image processing and signal processing. But this is just to show that you know, at some point uh, when I used to teach, or sometimes when I taught the interfacing class, uh, one of the final exam questions was, 
choose between all these different things you could do for this particular operation or application in, in a brand new factory, for example. Uh, some simple tasks, you can use microprocessors, you make a microcontroller board, you just use a PC with certain interface, do you use a programmable logic controller, do you use an FPGA, what are the pluses and minuses of each of these things? And this is one of the things you need to consider is the number ranges you get with each. Uh, so your microcontrollers are typically just going to always be um, integers. So that means you don't have this range of numbers here that you get with floating point. And that's a huge range. So if you need really big numbers, ranges from positive and negative, you want not a microcontroller. Uh, this is just showing the, the number representations. And if you have a sign bit, that's why you're only gonna have seven available bits for your magnitude range. That's why there's a difference there. And then precision. And precision is different than the magnitude. So the right hand on the right side of the decimal point is your precision, your mantissa. Your significant is also synonymous with mantissa. That gives you your precision. And you either have 23 bits of that for a single float or 52 bits. And that's just for how precise. That's not how huge of a number or how huge negative of a number it is. You might think, well, the negative isn't that now. That's different. What's on the right-hand side of your decimal point is your precision. And so that's your mantissum. Now, integers, you know, you can't get any more precise than one because there's no fractional part, right? It's an integer. Uh, now, this is definitely review for everybody in here. Now, in the future, I probably have to lecture this in this class because this is from this intro class that's no longer a prereq in the sequence of prereqs for this course. And I'm not going to go into that. I'll just click on the PDF here. Oops. Okay. Um, and we'll just skim through this really quickly. Now, in the lab projects here, I'm not going to probably ask you to do any kind of uh, non-numeric representation. But, you know, realize that we, uh, you know, the ASCII character is how we represent text and not doing computations with it. There's also EPSIDIC. I don't believe I put that in here. That was an IBM thing before ASCII became a standard. When I was inside IBM, we had to uh, adhere to, or, you know, accommodate both. And then binary versus hex. Everybody here shouldn't have that memorized by now. And then, oops, choose complement. I don't want to spend any time in here. Hold on, let me make this small. Let's go through it. So you should be familiar with how to do this kind of stuff in here, converting binary to decimal, decimal to binary. Uh, and floating point representations and how all this IEEE standard and how that all works and all that and special conditions for infinity and for zero and all that and how to deal with the part on the right hand side. So we may actually be designing floating point uh, uh, functional hardware in here. Uh, just some examples. We go through all that. So again, I don't want to spend time there. The back in here, and that's just an example. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you should remember how to do that. This is uh, how to make decimal 0.75 into a uh, single and double precision IEEE binary floating point. And so you got to get it into you know this normalized form of 1.1 times two to something, and then stuff it in this formula, and that determines how it spreads out in the bits. The exponent field is not the actual exponent that comes from uh, the represent, normalized representation, um, but it's rather goes in this formula and that allows you to have a range of exponent values. So you can uh, you know, go positive to negative 127. If you stuck 255 in here, you could have uh, 127. And if you put zero in here, you have negative 127. 
and then the same kind of thing, but with more bits for the exponent here for 60. This is double a double. You have 52 bits of precision here. We just have 23 bits of precision. You know the mantissa on the right hand side, uh, and, and your one. You know 1.1 1 .1 in the normalized form. The one is is of course uh, well, not of course obvious, but it's implied. It doesn't actually show up in your bits because everything needs to be in the form of one point something. So once you get it there, it's just understood that that's what it is. Even if the bits don't show that one. Okay, enough said that. This should be memorized by all the students in here. This is something I came up with in the 1990s to represent all, uh, all architectures to some sense, uh, all computing from all levels. Uh, when you have to process something. Now, if you're using an FPGA and you're using reconfigurable cells or lookup tables, uh, no, you're not going to do the processing here. And that's one of the strengths of FPGAs, actually, especially if you can do HDL things, then you're not really not laying it out. But if you're designing a processor and you're analyzing all the gate level and functional block things and, and the race conditions and the signal rise and fall times across the processor and the uh, triggering events at you know close to the speed of light across silicon. Um, then you know you're going to do things at gate level and do VLSI, or you're doing spice analog circuit transients too. You got to know exactly when you really have a one or uh, you know charged up a capacitance on a gate or or a signal line. So I'm not going to go through all this, but uh, the students know this. You need a program counter, such a hardware pointer, because of us. Uh, they learned this already that. Uh, uh, because of spatial locality of reference, this is a hardware counter. So you automatically increment it because in all likelihood and all probability, you're going to want the next instruction out of memory when you're fetching one instruction after another. Or if you're fetching data, most likely you're in gray, one piece of data after another. Everything most likely is going to be located you know, one right after the other. So that's why that's that. Uh, this whole control unit is going to have a finite state machine in here and the whole pipeline where you fetch and all that is part of lecture other lectures. This is the basic architecture. So students should already know this. And this is from the prerequisite course. Uh, everybody in here has had 332 presently. Everybody in the future will have had 330 and have seen this. Uh, so again, on microprocessors versus microcontrollers, um, microcontroller is supposed to be a single chip with everything on it. The microprocessor, though, will have memory separate and uh, with levels of cache too. And the levels of, uh, of cache, uh, the cache uh, that could or now very typically are on the same silicon as the uh, processor and in the same package. But nevertheless, there's separate entities. Uh, there's, there's static RAM, just like the registers in the CPU is fast, but expensive and not so dense. You still need main memory for your main memory, not, not storage, but the bulk of your memory. And then the caches are smaller, but you use them really fast to anticipate what you need next. Here's the microprocessor by itself. And then we'll have a whole lecture coming up and I won't drill down into this one, but this is uh, really like three hours of lecture condensed into an hour and a half video on YouTube. So when we go through that, we'll go nice and slow. And there's lots of things, as you can imagine, on this messy sheet of condensed things, mapping techniques and optimization, and cache coherency. Uh, but that's already on YouTube. Students have already seen this and we've already discussed this as the main equation for speeding everything up. A machine task equals the average cycles per instruction, which is very much hardware dependent and what they're learning quite a bit about in this course. Cache design is just one of the ways. Uh, but uh, you know, all, all pre-actions, so prefetching branches, uh, caching virtual address translations, uh, super scalar things, fetching different instructions simultaneously and working out the data dependencies and control dependencies and IO dependencies between the parallel pipelines. So as not to degrade the performance if there's dependencies. So that means you do out of order execution. And that's a whole other thing we'll talk about. Um, 
and we already mentioned this in here, but it's good to mention again that the computer architecture, the architects, computer engineers are the ones who do CPI, not electrical engineers typically ever, or computer scientists mostly, but it's the hardware, computer hardware. Oh, now we just announced the hardware thread. Uh, you know, it's part of the whole restructuring, all the robotic stuff that I've been doing here for years and the computer engineering that everybody in this class at the moment has done. Uh, it's becoming part of a bigger giant engineering program that grew to 10 times the size or eight times the size of the single computer engineering program. And then the robotics became a separate concentration in mechatronics. And now, and additionally, there's a hardware concentration now for computer science students that just got announced at the same time. So essentially what I've been doing for 23 years is now spreading out and uh, in a way that's more sustainable over time because uh, I'm 60 years old and I do maybe most likely we'll go to 66 or 65, but uh, you know, it's, it's a better configuration for the future. And this is just one example. I don't want to drill into a lot, but this is, uh, we uh, talk about a lot of robotics classes is simulation versus real time. It's important here too, because we're using simulations. We use simulations for our logism. We used to use Xilinx uh, which used to have gate level design in the integrated development uh, environment you know, the, where the IDE was still available, but then they switched to uh, all HDL now. We're still going to use them. And one of the, the teaching assistant here is actually going to do a big project on that. We're going to do it in here. We're just going to do it. But, um, you know, simulation is different than real, the real time stuff. And so, uh, and what you're really doing when you get down to the nitty gritty of everything. And in robotics terms, that gets down to simple simplified, fast reaction and sensing um, versus, uh, you know, right on the ground in real time on a planet that, you know, Mars takes up to 20 minutes for a signal from Earth. So you need autonomy. The thing has to work in real time by itself. But you can have a simulation that's gathering data about the, what the robot's doing on the other planet and do building an environmental map and then periodically sending information to the robot to uh, do things a little better. Uh, although we have actually uploaded global path planners to the robots in recent years. And so they uh, build their own environmental maps, but they still feed off of, uh, you know, triangulated data, data from ground-based observation on earth and satellites, uh, you know, an orbiter, if there is one around Mars while the rover's on the ground. <clears throat> Okay, um, uh, we did mention this already in this class, I'll just mention it again, because actually uh, what belongs right here. So the CPI is not just a function of uh, things with the processor and all the speed up mechanisms of the processor, but also the memory accesses. And so people in here, they probably know from classes with me before that any kind of memory reference instruction is gonna take longer than a register reference instruction or so we more, you know, time than an immediate reference instruction. So, so where's your data? You know, if you're processing a data, you fetch an instruction and you, uh, you decode the opcode and then you, you got some operands fields and that tells you about where the data is or what it is if it's actually embedded in the instruction. But most likely it's gonna be someplace, it's gonna be in a register, which is gonna be close by in static RAM and the register set right next to the processor. If you gotta go out, you know, over a motherboard, for example, or even an optical channel. I mean, wherever you're going, well, it wouldn't be an optical channel because that's more between systems. Unless you're gonna do DMA of another person's memory of another processor across a, a crossbar optical switch, I guess you could. But anyway, there's memory delays. And so uh, you have to factor that in how many memory delays there are. So P equals the number of cycles for instruction to be code and execute. M is the number of memory accesses per instruction because that's costly. Uh, just on a simple PC, your processor is running a last, lot faster speed than your motherboard is. So you got to slow down. I mean, forget the, the actual semi foring and error correction detection and, you know, charging up of things that you need to worry about. Just the frequency of the, the motherboard's less. And then the RAM's actually it used to be listed in access time, but it's essentially one over that is a frequency. So you have, a, you have three different frequencies there you have to deal with. And that can cause wait states in your finite state machine on your access. 
uh, every time there's a memory access. So you want to really keep track of, you know, not just internally on the processor, all of your speed up mechanisms to reduce your cycles per instruction, but also the number of memory accesses for a given instruction. Uh, and then this is talking about system attributes and uh, what you know performance factors are most relevant to different things. So in your overall instruction set, architecture, your I sub C is of course important, um, but your CPI averages also. Then in compiler technology, the memory reference is gonna become more, uh, more, uh, I would say also instructions of architecture for the memory reference too, but, but, and then processor implementation and control the cycle time and then cache and memory hierarchy. So what they're just saying here is a lot of the speed up, like if you're putting your effort into where biggest buck for your, your benefit for your cost, you put it into your cache and memory hierarchy and the controllers of that, the cache controllers, um, because that's where this memory latency is gonna get you. But I would argue also on in the instruction set and how you deal with memory reference instructions and how many levels, I mean, you can get some pretty complicated addressing modes in the Cisco machines that can, by virtue of just existing in the instruction set, be costly. So I might revise this myself. Now, this is an example of the students, and I think my our teaching assistant's actually going to program this right now. Uh, Jeff, so now you don't have to speak up because we're being recorded. But this is comparing microcontroller and microprocessor, and the students are going to simulate uh, this example and the one below. And so uh, what's going on here, the task is, uh, is to uh, uh, decrement a 16-bit uh, 16 bits in a general purpose register until it reaches 16 bit number in another general purpose register. All right, we have 16 bit registers, that's fine. Down here you have eight bit registers. So what you're seeing is you have to actually parse it into pieces and then have the subtraction, the borrows from the higher order bytes carry down. That's why this gets messy. But here, this is a microprocessor and the gist of it here is this is compare uh, and and branch, and this this is a specific syntax of Motorola assembler, where you have to say dot w for a word it means a word length, and actually words can be of different lengths depending on which company you're talking about. But word word here, and then so you're comparing, and then you're setting an appropriate condition flag in the status register. We'll talk about that in a second. And so our teaching assistant, when he's making his video, should point that out the down here. Anyway, the status flags as they're changing. But uh, this is, again, it's for a microcontroller. This is uh, Motorola. And this was a very popular one. The 68,000 was in, uh, 6800 was in an HP 41C calculator that I paid $300 for in 1982, uh, which is, you know, to take inflation account like a thousand dollars for a calculator now it was a beautiful thing though. i love the hp calculator you use the rpn notation and it was i mean uh or uh, or, or uh, the, the way you put the numbers in is actually called reverse pulse notation you put it in and um didn't mean to be a, a degrading term i don't believe that's just what it was called rpn and um but that motorola processor went into max for the longest time or was and uh, until IBM did the power PC chip to actually help, ironically, uh, Apple and Motorola stay competitive. You can imagine such a thing. That's a story I tell in other classes. But, um, but anyway, this code, decrement and branch if equal. And so these are combined instructions that you see there there's not many instructions here. These are powerful instructions. And a no op, uh, that just doesn't do anything. It's just there because there's a label here and then you need a way to jump out of this thing. So um, you wouldn't see a no op in the high level language. Uh, but it actually takes time. And you can use this in, if you want to delay for like debouncing circuits or you want to delay for a wait for some signal to settle. 
can you actually code those in on purpose? These are very expensive cycles though, especially, you know, decrementing and uh, branching, jumping. Now here's the same thing. What you see in the beginning here, if it was a flow chart, this is a, the whole first part here is a check to see if you're gonna fall out, if you're done the decrementing. So you actually try, try that first. And if not, you fall into the decrementing. And so that's what all this is going on here. Um, and so if you actually have reached your loop count or, or are you actually decremented to the two things are equal, then you jump to done and you're out. So if you do that, if you're, you know, you, when you make your flow charts, you wanna have your exit mechanism at the beginning before you start because it's just good coding, I think. And then you, then you start your decrement, decrementing. And so now we're moving um, a register contents of R0 into the accumulator. Now the accumulator, uh, this is left over from the days of when my dad worked in Burroughs and Foco Ford in the 1950s and 60s in aerospace and the space race uh, and the Cold War. Um, these old machines always had an accumulator, like you know, ENIAC in the Moore School in World War II, uh, it has a register, just all the results default and go into the accumulator. Now the accumulator is just one of many in a register set, but there's still, it's still used as a default name. It has a specific location right in the register banks. But uh, anyway, that, so you move register contents in the accumulator, then you're clearing the carry flag. Um, and the reason you're doing that is because this carry flag also acts as a borrow flag. Uh, it's it's it'll be set when you're borrowing from upstream. If when you do subtraction, you have to borrow sometimes from the left hand column. Um, and then this is subtract with borrow that deals with that carry. So that's why you're clearing ahead of time. Um, and then you're moving the accumulator in the R0. And, and it's backwards the way that works. So you actually the second thing goes into the first thing. There aren't three fields in this particular instruction set or up here too in the Motorola. Uh, the one we design in the earlier digital design class, you probably remember three fields, you know, two sources and a destination. Uh, that is nice to do, but for the sake of compactness and actually saves on real estate on the silicon too, you just uh, have two fields and it's implied that the result goes in the one. So that's what's going on in all these things here. Uh, you're moving R0 into A, uh, you're subtracting, uh, and this is... Uh, an actual number here, I'm decrementing by one. Um, there's other ways to do that, but you're, I'm decrementing by one by putting this pound sign and then zero one hex, which designates it's actually a, a, an immediate instruction with one number one hex being subtracted. Uh, there is actually a decrement instruction. I just threw this in here just for the sake of education. And what you're seeing then, then happen below here, I mean, you have to deal with two chunks here. So you have to like get the borrow from the upper order chunk uh, if, you, if that happens. So that's what's happening. You're parsing, you're doing a 16-bit operation with an 8-bit process. And the same thing applies to doing a you know, 256-bit wide piece of data on a graphic card somewhere in chunks. And still, this thing kind of still happens, 64-bit chunks, you know, oops. Um, and then so there's a status register. Uh, and so there's the program status where we'll talk about that in a second here. Whoops. What did I do here? Oh, this went down too fast. Uh, hold on. Go back up here, back down. So we're doing this code example. Now this is the same task, the same problem statement with the same two processors and the same two different instruction sets. Although this time it's memory referenced. And so you, this is a way of comparing that it's not always one is better than the other. If you have a lot of memory reference instructions, you, know, you might want to choose a microprocessor or a microcontroller depending on what you're doing. Uh, and so, uh, and it's also worth noting here that although there's so many instructions here, the actual cycle times, you know, 42 to 44 up here. And there's a range. This is one reason probabilities are involved now with, uh, with uh, 
with instructions because every time you you have branch prediction now in processors and if it's in the branch and you cache the previous branch targets that from the address formation in addition to the virtual address formation and so you end up with a range of numbers depending if it's if your address is in the in the cache of addresses this is not data instruction cache. this is a separate kind of cache this is a branch history table thing i wrote a program inside ibm for that and also for virtual memory for the virtual address translation lookups are the right thing for that too um and, and you don't know i mean necessarily if you're going to get it in the caches or not and so and with multiple cores uh, it really gets a wide range of things because you don't really know if you're going to have to flush or multiple pipelines if you're flushing pipes out if you're in somebody else's cache if somebody invalidates your cache another processor you know anyway um <clears throat> And that would be an interesting question on a final exam. Like, why why do we care about probability so much now in computer engineering? I'd be interested to hear what you say, because we'll learn about optimizing cache block sizes, uh, you know, the lines, cache line sizes, how many slots are in the caches, different mapping techniques, and the interprocessor communication delays, and the static and dynamic architectures multi-core multi-processor and how they scale or not and there's a lot of probability involved so anyway this um this is the status register for the simple device the simple device that has the carry flag that you set now they put cy here it also can be referred to as c when you write your assembler you have to assemble uh with a dot h file that defines the symbol the 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 character name for things like sometimes it's C and sometimes it's CY, but you're defining that in an include in a .h file. So people use different names. The, the addresses, the physical locations don't change, and there are physical addresses, bit locations. PSW.7 says bit number seven in the PSW address space. I mean, are in that space for that. Uh, important thing to mention here is the control flags. You're configuring the machine as well as status. So yeah, you care about carries and overflows and parity bits for serial communication. But you also want to configure the machine so you can check, you can change which register bank is the default. Why would you do that? Well, if you have you know you're going to have a program call coming up in your uh, in your code flow, and you want to preserve what's in the register bank that you're using in the moment. Then the first thing you do before you do your program call or your jump to another routine or 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 uh, at the beginning of an interrupt service routine, you you want to stuff away everything. Uh, or you want to leave alone what you were using, the registers you're using, and then you want to change to another default register bank and start manipulating stuff. And that would be actually a fun exercise in here to do. And then even do it in hardware after doing it in here. You know, you go crazy with the lab assignments, but and we're just recovering from COVID here after Omicron and Delta and Alpha before that. We're just coming out of all that. But anyway, um, still, we got to have fun. We got to go through the rear and you configure your machine you may want to change your register back and then when you've done your subroutine call your interrupt service routine or whatever you're doing you, you go back to where you were you stuff you know go back to the program counter that was pointing to where you jumped away from and you just stuff that maybe on the stack probably and you pop it off the stack you go back to where you were you first thing you do is you change your these flags back to the registers you were using before the indirection took you away and you restore the state of your machine that way. You can also stuff things on the stack, um, everything if you like. Now, uh, without drawing in the detail, this is what we did inside of IBM, and this is the evolution. So the stuff I worked on inside of IBM is now called Z architecture. And so it mutated over 25, 30-ish years almost <coughs> now to, uh, uh, and ironically, I installed IBM 360s when I was in the building industry in the 80s and then worked on 390s versions 
in the 90s. 360 actually didn't mean it's 1960s, it meant 360 around the earth. And then there was a system 370, which was the 70s version. And then there was no 380. And then there was 390. And then they realized, oh, these numbers are getting confusing and then just changed it to Z architecture. But if you search Z architecture, you'll see the same thing. The PSW, and I'm pointing out here, is a very complicated thing. I've up to 256 bits. Uh, you know, and, and uh, there's only 127 here, but uh, we had 256 for the whole thing. Let's put the status word, you see 390. We'll have to show you the one, but um, I may have been on a prototype machine. We switched the machines every year, but the program status word, I have to go back and check that, but it's, it's big. But the main point is it's not just status you're reconfiguring the whole machine so you can take this coke machine size thing or even one just one board with 20 processors on it back from the 1990s and you can make two completely separate running computers by reconfiguring the psw and we had somebody come in uh from mechanicsburg uh, and then right around 2000 ish we're in Pennsylvania here, we're near Mechanicsburg and Harrisburg, and that all of the military payroll was on an IBM System 390 that was partitioned into two machines. Uh, actually, they had a couple of them. So they had one for each branch of the military, and then they would partition. Or they had, like, I think they had two machines and two partitions on each for the four branches, something like that. I think I recall from 20 years ago, but uh, they were using System 390 and configuring it into multiple machine machines. Uh, CISC versus RISC. So we'll, the students in here will be designing their own instruction set and comparing to existing ones. And there's reasons for having complex instructions versus uh, reduced. Now in microcontrollers, the whole idea is to have the simplest device as possible. So you want it to be really simple. Uh, instruction set too, because the more Instructions you have, the bigger the opcode, the more hardware you have just to decode and execute all the different pieces. Your pipeline stages tend to balloon up depending on how many instructions you have. That was a problem with the whole Pentium evolution and the Katami extensions that happened 15, 20 years ago. Then the pipeline stages got, there's too many stages to deal with some of the new instructions and it would cause a degradation in performance if people didn't use those because there was a cost benefit thing and they figured, well, let's do that. Let's implement all the hardware so it can do these really high powered instructions with, uh, you know, the, with, with, the, with up to over 40 stages in the pipeline for the execution. But then the, just by virtue of having that in the machine, it slowed down some of the, the, the instructions that already existed before the new version came out. So the result was some people were buying this new machine, the Pentium machines, this is in early 2000, and uh, they were slower with their particular software than the old version because it had been optimized for certain instructions that weren't being used in those particular application development. <clears throat> okay, so this is more the stuff for interfacing kind of class, um, but it's important here too because uh, we're talking about large scale systems now. We had up to 2000 instructions in the uh, IBM machines, typical Pentiums and, you know, microprocessors nowadays are about 800. And the microcontrollers, uh, 32 to 250 basic stamp, pick microcontrollers, basic stamp things, you know, like 32. You can't get much less than that and be functional. Uh, the microcontrollers, simpler ones that I like to look at, the 8050 ones are 150. They ballooned up to 250, but not for a real good reason. They just have a different combination of the same operands. <clears throat> And then sys versus risk and so uh there's a bunch of stuff as you can see here and all these tables and a real in-depth comparison of what the difference is we won't go into here but that's here on my youtube channel mp4 or pptx with audio if you like uh, unlike this video i'm recording now live on top of the pdf uh so we won't i mean there is a pdx but or I'm, I'm doing it live on top of the pdx i don't have embedded audio uh, it's just a choice, I'm doing it one way or the other. This is something we talk about kind of superficially in lower classes. It's important to know the concept. Um, and here we'll learn more about it in detail. The virtual addressing. And so the idea here is, 
and I remember this happened inside of IBM because we went from 32-bit address space to 64. And we were systems level programmers as well as operating systems you know, developers as well as hardware developers. And all the programmers love it. Okay, we got 64-bit address space all over the place, but now we got to make the hardware work for this. <clears throat> and it doesn't make sense to have all the channels, all the pins coming out of the processor accommodating 64 bits of address because that's two to the 64 which is 16 billion billion right 16 billion is a big number times a billion uh that's not the realistic address space so you'll find like on the back of the pins of uh, of processors nowadays 40 pins coming out because two to the 40 is a terabyte of ram and as of yet, we don't have a terabyte of RAM yet, but you know, soon that will change, but you could just add, you know, two more pins here and you've then got eight terabytes. So you don't need 64 bits, but why am I saying all this? Well, because IBM and everybody else since then has had to deal with this virtual address translation and it is a headache and it's not, I mean, it's several pages you got to deal with. Them. I had to write code to deal with all this and test all this, and it was a headache. And uh, the translation happens every time you use RAM, every time. Every time you address anything in RAM, I mean, talk about memory access as being costly. Uh, you're doing virtual addressing, and then you have to cache those virtual addresses. You have to translate every single address before you actually go get something. You know, Not if it's in your registers on your CPU, but if you're going out to memory, quote unquote, yep. Um, and so inside of IBM, I remember we had like uh, in the custom kernel we made to test the hardware, um, we had everybody, you know, had certain blocks that you could play with in the address space because we were using a two to the 32 bit address space. And, you know, it wasn't, wasn't tight. There was still some room left, but when we went to 64, it was like, you put anything here anywhere you want because it's just such a ridiculously huge space. So the software, the operating system, the code writer systems, so the systems and application level developers, you just have, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. You think you got two to 64 space. The hardware people though, you got to deal with this and translate it because you only have so much real physical memory because of cost constraints. And, and I mean, why would you have, uh, you know, a billion, billion, uh, I mean, if you have a terabyte of RAM, that's fine. You don't, you don't need a, you know, billion, uh, or you know, 16 million terabytes <clears throat> is what a billion billion would be. And then we have a whole lecture on that. So there's a memory management unit. And this is where that you saw, remember that table up above and it said how you deal with memory management is where you're going to op optimize the uh, uh, performance. Uh, you know, those MKs that you add to the, uh, the number of memory accesses to your reducing your cycles per instruction. Yeah, now I, I argued up above that's also part of your instruction set in the addressing mode you allow, but you know, the bulk of it's gonna be in these virtual address translations and then uh, you know, dealing with memory management and cache coherency on shared memory processors where you know, your bunch of caches all think they can hammer away at one piece of data in memory, but only one can at a time. So you have to resolve that and it's, it's you know, hardware controllers or firmware. This is a review for everybody, not gonna go in here, but you should all have this all memorized by now. What an instruction format is, opcode operands, what a finite state machine looks like. This example we did in the lower class, drill down, look at pipelines and design, not gonna go into here. You know, understand that, you know, simplest pipeline is this thing or is this, this is no pipeline, this is pipeline, right? I mean, the idea is you, while you're fetching the next instruction, you're, you're decoding the last instruction while you fetch the next instruction. That's not super scalar. Super scalar is I'm doing two fetch at a time. Here's a two-way super scalar. Uh, parallel processing systems now need out of order execution and optimized scheduling to avoid penalties where dependencies between data IO and control can cause delays when one part is waiting on another. Yeah, that's a big deal. 
And so we're going to spend some time in here and I'm not going to drill them down now, but you can see this gets messy and will take several weeks to go over all the details of this kind of thing. Then there's an introductory lab that's well, your next lab in here will look like this, but probably maybe just these two things. And what depends if I ask you to do the FPGA HDL and the assembly at the same time, I might just ask you to do this. Uh, or I might scale this up and yes, just one of those two things. I gotta think about it, but I'll give you when you're next Wednesday, this time next week, I'll have this next assignment due. Spring breaks after that, and you know, you'll have some time to do it. But uh, and then here is an example from a previous class of a final project, final lab project uh, in uh, in this class for a uh, dual. Uh, Super, I gotta fix that. I just changed it. Let's just say dual core super scalar. Well, luckily, I mean, this video is gonna have that wrong, but I'm correcting it on the video. And then before I save the PPT, I'm gonna fix these typos and save that as the MP4 that I upload. No, I, I, this will be the MP4 actually, uh, and the YouTube, but the PPTX and the PDF will have the correct ones. Just typos. Watch this little video. Hi, I'm Nathan and I'm Aaron, and this is our final project for EGR 433 Advanced Computer Engineering. The particular goal of this project was to build and implement a dual core two way superscalar computer that could perform a specific set of instructions that is detailed in our report. In this video, we will be going through the different layers of our project, and at the end, we will have a quick demonstration. This right here is our outermost layer of our project. Uh, it is sort of a top down view of the outermost perspective. Here we can see the finite state machine at the top, a main clock that represents the stages of fetch, decode, execute, and write back. And here we can see core one and core two. This down here is just a set of displays so that we can manage and uh, observe our outputs. Here at the bottom, we have a shared memory block that is used by both cores so that we can read to and write from this uh, register right here, depending on the instructions sent to these cores. This priority encoder right here, as well as uh, this OR gate and these inputs over here are used to prioritize which core gets to write to the shared memory if they were both to get the instruction simultaneously. Here we have the core of the system. Each core has two pipelines in order to represent the superscalar aspect of the computer. Um, each pipe receives the fetch to code execute write back clock signals from main, as well as operands and op codes from the finite state machine and outputs different things according to the op code. Um, these also have general purpose register, which is used to share data between both pipelines, just like the dual cores share read and write data between them. So let's take a deeper look into each pipe. So here I'll just zoom out because this is actually a pretty large block. Here we go. Here we have the opcode in pin right here. This is what takes in the opcode that is originally given through main and then fed into the core, which then has two sets of opcodes and operands that is fed into each pipe. The opcode is then sent into this control logic block here, which interprets the information and outputs depending on the state here, uh, either signals for specific conditions uh, re regarding shared memory or GPR, it, or, depending on the, or depending on the state, it may send uh, signals here through these bits to control which function is active and bits here to control which information is passed into the functional block. This may seem a bit messy over here, but this is used to take in operand data 
and the GPR data and select which one is passed into these MUXs in, alongside the up and down counters. This is so that we can control when the, when the pipe takes in GPR data or operand data. Here we have our finite state machine. Um, this basically goes through two different ROMs, each of which controls an entire core. Um, so the clock signal activates this counter right here, which cycles through the instructions in ROM. Um, each instruction has information for an entire core, both operand and opcode data. And this is divided up between each section and sent back into each individual core. This is our control logic. I'll zoom out because this is also a pretty large block. Uh, this is set up in the same sort of fashion as rail logic, which is a pretty traditional way of showing our information. Uh, these four bits are from the opcode are then separated into, uh, into bit signals of, um, of W, X, Y, and Z, as well as their knots. Depending on the setup here, we used K maps to determine the simplest way of doing this. We send the signals into different setups of AND gates and OR gates to send resulting signals to our multiplexers, which determine which data is to be used, as well as to our demultiplexer signal, which then tells the functional block what is and isn't the goal of this instruction. Down here at the bottom, we have these very specific instructions that are related to reading and writing to shared memory, either at, in the core layer to the GPR or in the main layer with the shared memory. Here we have our function block. This takes in information from both registers as well as a signal from the control logic. The control logic determines where the data goes into which function. So here we have a comparator, an adder, an AND gate, and an OR gate. Each of these outputs to its pipe. Then just real quick, because we didn't want to have to keep dragging and dropping clocks uh, into our different pipes, we have this setup for clocks. This is an up counter and down counter that we were able to just click and drag as a single block into each pipe. We can control this at a higher level as we saw with the main. We did the same thing with registers as you may recall from our earlier discussion in the pipe. Here at the top, it takes in information from the multiplexers, which are used to determine the data that is passed through and latched onto the registers. And then we have a signal that comes in here that is telling this to update. It outputs whatever data is currently in the register out these pins. Here we have our main clock. This controls every cycle that cycle. it goes through. Um, we have a main clock over here, counts from zero to three. Each two represent a different fetch, decode, execute, or write back cycle. Um, it sends out a different clock signal out of each of these pins to do different things on each stage in each core. All right, now that we've gone through the different layers of our project, let's just do a quick demonstration. Uh, so first I'm going to set the up and down counter data. And I'm just going to cycle through the instruction sets. As you will notice at the top, it, these probes are showing what current data is being passed through. We're just going to keep going through. We can see the comparators here are being activated. We can see based on these instructions here that these are being activated. And if we keep going, then what we will see eventually, here we go, with the most recent passive information, uh, one of these cores was told to, in the previous cycle to write to shared memory, which it has. And now we have data in our shared memory, which proves that our circuit is indeed working. And that is our project. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and we hope that you enjoyed your stay.
And this is something that another group did and could probably be the one that I asked the students to do in this class. Um, I'm still thinking about it. Uh, this is a vector register machine, also has a neuron transfer function. And we're gonna look at some neural network processors. Uh, not not in depth at the ones that I developed that I teach about in my robotics and machine intelligence class. I mean, even there, we don't look that much in depth. I, at times in the past, when I've taught this course, I've dug down deep into those. Um, but we have some really recent new ways of doing things with different transfer functions, <clears throat> and, uh, and even on the graphics processors and uh, the CUDA cores and things which we'll discuss in here, and I'm leaning towards going towards something like that, maybe. Although, you know, we're, this has been a disrupted semester already with COVID and uh, we're ramping up a little slower than normal just to accommodate that. So let me see what's digestible to do. Um, and then this is, I mean, this, if anybody watching this wants to learn more about stuff I've done. I, this is part of an intro talk uh, where you can hear about the IBM stuff and my neural network stuff and what we did with IBM. All that. Okay. So, so almost an hour and a half lecture. Um, okay. So, um, I don't believe we need to dig into any more of that. Let me stop recording now. <clears throat>